I'm Maura Cook, and I'm District Director of the Health Department here in Addison County. I'm also the convener of the Addison County Committee on Opiate Addiction. We are a group of human service providers and concerned citizens that are focused on prevention, education, treatment, and recovery for those who are struggling with the disease of opiate addiction. Today our show is going to focus on prevention and education, which is a very important topic. And I'm really pleased to have Sharon Kohler, who is a student assistant professional counselor at Mount Abraham Union um, Middle and High School, as well as Brooke Jetty, who holds a similar role at Middlebury Union High School. Thanks so much for coming today, guys. Really great to see you. I'm just going to launch into some questions and we'll have a conversation. So, Sharon, what is an SAP counselor? What's your role in Talk of what's a typical day look like for you? Okay, uh, an SAP counselor is a um, mental health and substance use um, specialist who is located in the schools to provide education, prevention services, early intervention. So my role is very diverse, which is great. I really enjoy that. I work with students individually and in groups to provide um, them some with information about mm -hmm. substance abuse, addiction, uh, to work on healthy coping skills, developing some positive, um, some positive life uh, decision making and stress management, things like that. I'm also a resource for faculty, staff, and parents. Oh, great. So I could be called to consult if somebody has a question. Parents may call in for some information. Um, and I also, in our school, provide some leadership opportunities for students, which uh, comes in the form of some advising some clubs. The students sort of decide on what they want to focus on, but it's all generally focused on making the school a better place. So, mm. so my day would involve a lot of individual and group meetings with students, um, and then some consulting with staff, some coordination with outside resources, some prevention activities with my student groups. Uh, so it's really a great, and I will provide things to the newsletter, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a really varied day, but it's all focused on prevention and education around substance use. Um, and in, in my mind, prevention definitely involves both giving education directly about substances, but also building assets and skills for being healthy in your life. So, um, so it's really nice. Great. Nice variety of services that I'm able to provide at Mount Abe. Great. It sounds like there's no typical day. There is not. <laughs> no, it's it's um, no, it's really varied and pretty open ended in terms of what kinds of things we can provide, which is great. Um, and it's it's an open door for students, which okay. is also wonderful. Um, okay. So yeah. Great. So Brooke, how is your role similar, different, and what's a typical day, typical day look like for you? So my role is different in a little, just a little bit. It's pretty much exactly what, what I do. My role is a prevention specialist and very similar to Sharon's role as the SAP. It's around prevention intervention with students, with faculty, um, with the community. And it's really, I mean, there's just so many parallels between the two roles. And I think that's also because we used to have an SAP and okay. we don't anymore. And so this role covers the SAP role as well as um, a lot of pro-social groups that we do. So you mentioned the clubs. Mm -hmm. um, and a typical day too is similar. It's kind of all over, depending on what the need is of the student. And I was thinking about you know a typical day, a student just asked me recently, they come in for a health class and they ask, they have to ask a, um, drug and alcohol person various questions for their health class and they said what's a typical day mm -hmm. and I thought well there really isn't one but typically what happens is um, you know there'll be some individual work that happens during a day there'll be um, a typical Tuesday might start off with a peer leader meeting before school and then a couple kids are seen individually for emotional and behavioral um, drug and alcohol support whatever might be presenting and they usually schedule ahead of time so I know what's going to be happening and there are drop-ins similar to Sharon's position and then on Tuesdays we have a student-led um, mental health support group that I facilitate and oversee and that's been going on for about a year and then 
It might be a health or nutrition meeting in the afternoon with some more individual time, maybe once a month. I'm not sure if the SAP does this, but you sit in on maybe a 504 meeting or an IEP meeting to mm -hmm. help planning for a particular student. Um, and you're also fielding phone calls from parents or from a faculty person who's concerned about a student. I'm answering a text from a peer leader who has a concern about one of their ninth graders that they oversee. Um, so it really is kind of anything that walks through the door. And there is plan time too as well Great. and scheduled appointments. Great. So I want to delve into a few things that you mentioned um, in your introductions. One, you're an SAP counselor and what is... Prevention specialist. Prevention specialist. So not every school uh, or a high school has an SAP specifically. Right. It typically, is there a prevention focused staff member in, in each school? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, no. okay. Um, I think it's, we're very fortunate in Addison County. I think that it's something that the counseling service of Addison County has been very much dedicated to having somebody in the schools. Yes. And I know that you were talking beforehand that they're mm -hmm. looking for somebody right now for Jen's mm -hmm. position that's open. Um, you have the SAP at Mount Abe and then at the high school we have a prevention specialist. But I think that's very unique to Addison County. And it's such a great resource to have somebody who's really focused on prevention um, in the schools because it's a great opportunity to instill some positive behaviors mm -hmm. there at the schools. Um, okay, so you guys talked about a lot of things <laughs> that you do. Um, can you talk more, delve in more about the peer programs? I heard this really interesting um, piece, Brooke, that you said about the peer, peer leaders, peer leaders the program, yep. yeah, and then the mental health peer-led support yep. group. Those are amazing, and it sounds like Sharon, you have similar. So, Brooke, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so, the peer leader program is just a great program that's been at MUHS for over 20 years. Um, I think it maybe started in the mid-1980s, and it's really grown. And the purpose of the peer leader program is to have a group of juniors, and then they become seniors, who are trained to facilitate the transition for ninth graders coming into the high school. The idea being that they are trained from an outside source to lead and facilitate groups, and they meet in, when they're juniors with their eighth graders to establish relationship and orient them to the high school. And then now with technology, they stay in touch with them over the summer through um, social media. And the whole idea is to really build relationships with the ninth graders so that every ninth grader has a peer in the school they're connected to. So our advisory program is how we do that. So twice a week, the peer leaders will meet with their ninth grade advisories and they will work on building relationships, um, building a sense of community, building the advisory group with the advisor to um, have a sense of belonging, really push extracurricular activities. Um, and then they're trained in areas around drug and alcohol prevention. They're trained in relationship issues, whether it's relational violence. Um, I think bullying is something that they've really taken quite seriously. Um, and then just if there's anybody who seems to be presenting with any mental health issues, they're the eyes and the ears. So then they triage that. They'll come to me, they'll go to their guidance counselor, they'll tell somebody, as they're trained to do, about what's going on for their particular ninth grader. And what we love to see is have the peer leaders communicate directly back with the ninth graders because we understand that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring to be the most useful because students are really going to hear other students mm -hmm. and what they have to say. And if it's at a higher level of need, then we certainly will refer that to an adult in the school. But we always try really hard to coach them on how to work through that. And that's been a great program and it's the purpose is to really get students connected as soon as they walk through the door and start building that relationship and resiliency. That's great. Yeah. Really positive. Yep. And positive for both the eighth grader who comes in the door and then for, of course, the skills, amazing skills for the older peer leader students. And they love it. Yes, of They course. do. That's it's a great, great role to be in. Great. So Sharon, talk a little bit about peer programs at Mount Aim. Sure. We have, um, we have a couple that are in, in place right now. We actually are <coughs> a middle and high school housed in one building. Right. Um, and I work more with high school, but I do some work with middle school as well. So we have... Um, kind of two leadership groups that are in place right now for high school students. One is the Vermont Teen Leadership Safety Program, which is um, a club that's focused on 
improving the school yeah. in terms of health and safety awareness and also doing leadership um, and community service. So they decide on topics they want to focus on each year. We just finished a red ribbon campaign to raise awareness about impaired driving um, this month. We usually do a, an ally week where we're focused on um, being an ally mm -hmm. and preventing bullying. Mm -hmm. They have been focusing a lot in recent years about kind of improving self-confidence um, and um, resisting peer pressure, those kinds of things. We also do some community service like serving dinner at the food shelf and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's an opportunity for the students to take on a leadership role in the school and mm -hmm. in the community. We work mm -hmm. with police sometimes and rescue <coughs> folks um, on different activities. So they get some leadership experience, but they also get to bring to the forefront issues that they feel are important in terms of health and safety. And then there's also a, a club that focuses on our youth risk behavior survey data. Mm -hmm. So the students actually look at Mount Abe's data. Um, the youth risk behavior survey is a, a self-report survey that students all over Vermont take, and it kind of gives you a snapshot of what students are saying are their um, assets and their risk factors, things that they've experienced um, in terms of drug and alcohol, even seatbelt use, all kinds of health and safety issues. So the students look at that data and then they decide as a group what they think is important. What are some strengths that our school is showing and what are some areas of concern? And then plan some action steps around that. So that's another leadership opportunity. Um, and that we also are just in the process, I was actually, one of the nice things about having a colleague in the in the area is that Brooke and I do work together on things. Sometimes right. we are good resources for each other. And right. um, so I actually talked with her earlier this year to find out more about their peer mon mentor um, program. And we, the health, the middle school health teacher and I are in the process of setting up a training to try to get something. It'll be a little different, um, mm -hmm. but a peer mentor program going at Mount Abe. So we're just putting out the call in January when we get back from break, and we have a training set up for February. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting that started as well. Right. So just another opportunity for students to sort of help each other out, learn some good skills, yeah, have more resources I mean, the, in the building. It sounds like a lot of the prevention work you mm -hmm. do is all about skill building for students. It's huge. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah, there is also direct education, mm -hmm. you know, providing information about addiction and about different substances. But a, but a big part is really building those resilience skills, which are our things that help us manage difficult things in our lives and help us bounce back, right. resist kind of negative influences. Um, so that's definitely a big mm -hmm. part, I think, right. of what both our schools do. Right. So. Yeah. so Sharon, you've mentioned the word assets mm -hmm. a couple times. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that? And then I'll have a follow-up question for Brooke as well. <laughs> sure. So um, assets, it's, it's sort of a, a word that's been applied to skills, uh, life circumstances, um, different things that a person has that help them withstand negative um, influences, help them cope with life. So it could be having a, a strong family um, relationship, for example. Could be having the skills to say no mm -hmm. when something comes up. So assets are anything that kind of gives you confidence and skill. Um, Feeling a sense of purpose in your community is an asset. So, and there's been some research. The Search Institute uh, has done a lot of research and has actually come up with a list of 40 assets that um, folks can look up if they want to. It's a great resource, um, and it, it just lists all the things that can that have been proven mm -hmm. to sort of help kids be more resilient and end up healthier mm -hmm. in life. So. So that's what I mean when I say assets. That's so, great. Yeah. Thank you for mm -hmm. the explanation. Sure. And Brooke, in the introduction, you talked about attending meetings such as 504 and IEP meetings. Mm -hmm. um, what are those? And Sharon, is that something you do as well? So IEP are um, individual educational support plans. Those are for students who need additional support, whether it's behavioral, emotional, mm -hmm. academic. Um, and 504s are students who need accommodations, and the accommodation might be um, for an uh, interim period of time. It might be around acute anxiety mm -hmm. that someone's working through. And the idea around both the 504 and the IEP is to have a team of people working, similar to what you're talking about in terms of those assets, working to really hold that individual in a way that's successful. Mm -hmm. So giving them the skills that they need, the supports that they need to be successful, whether it's um, 
test taking in class mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, working through dyslexia and having the supports in place that are needed. And oftentimes with IEPs and 504s, part of the support plan is to have somebody they can access within the school to talk to during the day. So that's where my role comes in, okay. and that's how I'm part of the team. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. and the developmental assets that you were talking about are just such an important factor that if parents don't know about them, community people don't know about them, to really look at those. And I keep a list on my door, and I look at it every time I go in. It's just so important that we make those connections, and I think we do a really great mm -hmm. job at our schools with the adults that yeah. kids are connected to, your advisory system that mm -hmm. you have, that mm -hmm. we have at MUHS. Um, coaches, administration, um, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the VTLSP group that you have, it's just in the peer leader program at MUHS, it's just such an important part of the process in building that resiliency and those healthy choices which are just so critical at this point in their lives because they're right. just right at that place of, right. you know, right. which way do I go? Mm -hmm. There's right. just right. so many choices. Mm -hmm. right. And Sharon, are those types of meetings that you attend? Yes, them? although yeah. I'm more often, I don't attend them a lot, I'm more often someone who is referred to after one of those meetings. Sometimes, okay. I, right, like sure. as Brooke was yeah. saying, I might be identified um, as a person that can be a resource for that student. We, we do have, I tend to be invited to more of the educational support team mm -hmm. meetings, which are triggered by a student having um, either behavioral, a lot of behavioral referrals or, um, a couple of F's, you know, having right. some academic issues. Right. Um, and so if it's a student that I am already connected with, I'll often attend one of those meetings e as a support and a resource. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of opportunities in our schools for people to come together to try to help, uh, you know, get kids on the right track. So right. which it is great. Yeah, it's, it's great. It sounds mm -hmm. like there's a lot of building connections, mm -hmm. bu um, mm -hmm. strong, positive connections for the students in the schools and connecting them with a you know trusted friend trusted peer trusted adult you mentioned coaches and other adults mm -hmm. in the school so let's talk about um, some so why kids are maybe more susceptible you said that uh, Brooke you mentioned that they're at this critical age where they can make a choice to go one way or another talk about why they may be more susceptible as teenagers to mm -hmm choosing to do something that isn't so positive for themselves, and um, how brain development factors into all of this. Well, I think that is the crux, the brain development piece. I think um, there's been so much great research that's come out in the last you know, five to 10 years, and the frontal lobe, this, this part that we need for reasoning and, and good decision making isn't fully developed until the mid-20s. Um, and that in itself is huge, and I think about the reward pathway mm -hmm. and you know when kids are transitioning from middle school to high school their thrill seeking center the amygdala you know is i forgot i think it was maybe two or three times the size of that of an adult so they have this you know incredible need to take risks and mm -hmm. so the challenge is how do you present those healthy risks whether it's um, you know having a sport that they're involved with a play uh, finding activities for them to do on the weekends you know scary movie night at Johnny's house, uh, but you know, like opportunities right. for them to really get that right. need met that's not through the drug and alcohol um, route, but it's, it is something that you're, it's really challenging because they have access mm -hmm. when they come into high school. There's also more availability. And then there's that peer piece where the people you've always been friends with are making these choices. And it's really hard to have that skill set and for, to know how to say no in the moment because it's not practiced at home necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, across the board. I'm sure some families, you know, start talking about it at a young age, and I think we're doing a much better job in the health curriculum in the elementary school and middle school to talk about kind of that resistance training and right. and how you say no and phrases that you can have in your head, um, whether it's, you know, going to a friend's house and you're in middle school and there's a rated R movie they're showing, you're not, you know you're not supposed to watch the rated R movie, so how do you say no and get out of that awkward situation? It's the same skill set you're going to need when you're when you hit high school and it's around drugs and alcohol or driving without seat belts or you know just that high risk right. behavior. Israel seeking behaviors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also peers I think are becoming as at the, in that age kids are kind of shifting from their family being their mm -hmm. primary um, source of support mm -hmm. and validation to peers being really um, who they're looking to right. 
to feel accepted and um, and okay. And so, if peers are, and there and there will be more who are do making these other choices, and it's it's really hard to not fit in and to feel like mm -hmm. you're okay when when you are the one saying, I can't do that, not going to do that, and mm -hmm. in, you know. Mm -hmm. it, so that's really tough. And family influence is really important, but kids start to get a lot more of their validation from their friends at that age, and so um, so that can be a real challenge mm -hmm. too. So even if they have the skills, sometimes it's hard to apply them Absolutely. just because of feeling like, oh, I'm not going to be accepted. I'm not right. going to be part of this group anymore. Right. So it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Sure, sure. So what should parents, caregivers, um, concerned adults in the community, community be looking for in terms of risky behaviors? What might they be seeing if somebody, if, if a teenager is engaging in drug and alcohol use? Um, what are some more warning signs that you guys identify? Um, there, I'm, I'm sure we share this. Mm -hmm. um, I think just a shift in attitude and behavior mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. huge indicator, and that can also be around other issues regarding mental health. So it might be, you know, I think the same signs are for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, you know, withdrawal from the regular activities. Mm -hmm. You know, shifting their peer group, dropping grades. I mean, there's just wherever there's a change, I always, and that's when teachers are really great about referring when they see a real change, because they might see the change academically before the parent does. So that's an I'm important sure. source of referral. Mm -hmm. um, where there's a real departure from who you know them to be. Mm -hmm. And it can be indicative of a lot of different things. Those, right. and so, but what's important is that it's a red flag, yeah. and that means that somebody needs to check in and see what's going on. And, and having f folks like Brooke or myself in the school is, it's just a great opportunity to have those conversations and there's someone you can say, you know, I'm worried, can we right. have, can you check in with this person or can you give me some tips about how to ask those questions? So, yeah. um, so it's, it's not always a, you know, you see A, B, C and that means D, but it definitely means something's going on. And, right. and having, um, whether it's depression or anxiety or any of those things going on also puts you more at risk for using substances. Exactly. People try to change how they're feeling um, mm -hmm. when they're in distress and, and one of the ways that they may try to do that is with drugs or alcohol. So, mm -hmm. um, so even if that's not what's happening right now, it also puts them more at risk that's for, point. for okay. use. So Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really helpful. And yes, it, it could be substance abuse that you're seeing, or it could be depression, right. anxiety, mm -hmm. or one could be leading to mm -hmm. the other. Those Absolutely. are really important yeah. messages. So what resources are there for parents? It sounds like you guys are fan mm -hmm. fantastic resources within the school and can reach out to parents, but what else is there for parents in the community and caregivers in the community? So I want to highlight too, at, at school, there are additional supports mm -hmm. other than just us. Mm -hmm. I think okay, great. our nurses do a great job and they're in contact with families all the time about different mm -hmm. issues going on. And they provide a lot of information. Our school does around tobacco use and um, they have all the information there and they sometimes are the, on the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, our school counselors, probably mm -hmm. similar to you, mm -hmm. are a great source because they're also seeing kids on a regular basis and they're a great support for parents to talk about grades mm -hmm. and to help um, have those conversations with their students mm -hmm. and with parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have our resource officer, Chris Mason, who's another great link in our community to parents and staying connected. And then uh, we use Parent Up as a resource mm -hmm. where we kind of push parents in that direction, but also having the conversations with us, having them come in and talk with us. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard in our community. I feel like there's not a lot of community um, acceptance around support. For this issue oh, and interesting yeah. that's my perspective my perspective excuse me um, I, I feel like there's a barrier and, and I'm right. not and I'm not really sure what that's about but there aren't when we provide opportunities for right. parents for informational nights mm -hmm. for instance mm -hmm. we you know we advertise that we have good speakers and maybe 10 people will show up or 15 people will show up and and it's the same folks who usually come and I know it's really hard and mm -hmm. schedules are really difficult but there is this challenge in terms of connecting parents to community resources. Do you think there's a stigma f associated with asking for help or reaching out and saying, oh, I'm struggling as a parent? I, th I actually was just meeting with students, some students in one of the leadership groups last week, and we were talking about setting up a parent evening 
later in the year around, actually around suicide prevention. Um, and the students said, you know, people may not come if you call it this. And I think it's the same kind of, just because there is a little bit of a stigma attached. And if, if my parent shows up, does that mean they're worried about me? Right. Whether it's, you know, alcohol and drug use or, so I think there is probably, or the students anyway, were telling me that they think that there is some of that. And so trying to, to frame things in a way that's um, building strengths and resilience. But even then, it's mm -hmm. hard to get folks to show up. So I think it's a combination of things, probably some stigma, but also probably just folks are busy and overextended. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so it is hard. And so I, just to add on to what Brooke was saying, some other um, resources that maybe are more accessible um, are pediatricians' offices mm -hmm. are a right. great first right. place to bring up concerns right. <coughs> for both for the kids and also their parents. Um, that's kind of a non-threatening place sometimes to bring those things up. And I think all of our, or at least most of our pediatricians practices now have mental health professionals embedded right. in their practice. So if there is a concern, there's somebody right there who mm -hmm. can meet with the family. Um, so that's a great kind of first line of, of defense too. If, if parents are concerned, um, just make an appointment with your pediatrician and have a conversation about it. And they will be a good resource and have some mental health backup so that's great yeah i'm gonna just take an opportunity to put in a plug mm -hmm. for um the, uh, the website that this committee has developed it's called addictionhelpvt.com and it does list a warning signs of addiction um, flyer and some information for treatment mm -hmm. prevention and education mm -hmm. and recovery yep. so what if i know you talked about sharon um that peer, the peer influence at this age and stage for teenagers is really huge. But how about um, parental substance use? How does that factor in for kids? And um, what do you guys do in schools to address those sorts of issues? That is, that's a tough one. And it definitely it is an added risk factor for, for kids. Um, I think both well, for a lot of reasons, there's availability when mm -hmm. if parents are, whether it's drinking or smoking or using um, marijuana or whatever, it's just going to be more available and it's easier to get access to it at home. A lot of, on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, a lot of kids say they get their alcohol right. at home and it may be with permission or without permission, but either way, it's just more accessible. So mm -hmm. that's certainly a risk factor. Kind of, I think our societal um, messages which can be from parents or can be from society as a whole that substances whether it's legal or illegal um, mm -hmm. are a way that we celebrate mm -hmm. it's a way that we handle our emotions negative emotions so the more I think kids see that modeled whether at home or just in society in general the more likely they are at 14 or you know when they're trying to figure out who do I want to be as an adult and how do I want to handle things they're more likely to go that direction when they're seeing it um, so I think for multiple reasons it's an added factor uh, I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on that one no I would just uh, expound on that um, I remember Brina Holmes came and spoke at a parent night that we had and she talked about that she mm -hmm. said it's just so important that when you come home at the end right. of the day you show your kids how you can relax by going for a walk mm -hmm playing a family game, taking a bath, you know, finding other ways and demonstrating and modeling for them. Because anything you do, mm -hmm. I think I was talking to our uh, driver's ed teacher and he said, gosh, you know, I can talk to kids till I'm blue in the face about distracted driving, but if they see their parents doing mm -hmm. it and they see sure. their parents on the phone or eating or texting mm -hmm. or whatever it is, they're gonna copy that behavior because it's normalized right. in their family. Um, so I think that's a huge piece that you don't necessarily, you have good intentions and you don't necessarily think about that that your kids are watching everything mm -hmm. you do. Right. And I think it also is dependent upon the resiliency of a, of a student and a teenager. I think the more resilient that student is, the less likely mm -hmm. they are to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And when you have other things built in, like sports contracts, um, peer expectations, I think they're also more resistant to following some of mm -hmm. maybe not the best right. behaviors that they see at home. And I think the opposite end of that spectrum is those kids who struggle with kind of that internal regulation and um, and don't have maybe as many supports in their lives, it's it's harder for them because I don't yeah. think they have the same healthy choice and decision making that goes along with that resiliency. 
So it looks like we're about out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm noticing over here, but it, but it's one, I think what communities and parents can do is just keep supporting kids, Thank providing you. them with the lots of opportunities, um, lots of connections, having those interpersonal connections are huge. Um, Talking about it. Yep, keeping the topic yep. on the table, not putting it under the table, right. um, but just trying to build those assets and provide a rich, a rich environment for kids to figure out who they are and what choices they're going to yep. make. And we yeah. have a great community, so just have we to do. all support our kids. <laughs> and I just want to thank you guys so much. It was so great to hear a, just a little bit about the work you do. It sounds like you're doing phenomenal work in your schools, and it's just really great to hear about the prevention resources you're providing. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. <laughs>